Welcome everyone to another episode of the Average Ontario Anglers podcast. We have our episode number 51 today, and it's going to be a, another one, a very timely one for this time of year. Uh, I know Jesse and I, we talked about on the last podcast uh, about us already being in the canoe on the open water. I know ice fishing was um, unfortunately very short this year, <laughs> if you even got out once. But uh, but we're going to be talking a bit about our boat prep. Uh, no matter what vessel you have, if you're big or small, but we're going to get into that a little bit later on. To start us off, as Jesse says, as tradition states, we're going to have an interesting fishing fact that Jesse has prepared for us. So let's uh, let our, let's let our ears be filled with wonder by Jesse's interesting fishing fact. Yeah, so don't let your ears be filled with wonder because all these things I'm about to tell you are illegal activities. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is the disclaimer these may be interesting but i'm pretty sure I'm like 99.9 percent .9 sure that everything i'm about to tell you is completely illegal to do in ontario so if you're listening to this in your car as you're driving turn it down if you see a cop drive by this is how sketchy it is so i thought it would be an interesting thing because i was talking to a guy at work and he's like you know do you ice fish and i was like yes i do ice fish like if there's ice and he's like that just seems like the stupidest way to catch a fish and I explained to him, I'm like, actually, it's not. It's actually the biggest, like, screw you to nature. Because you're like, nature's like, I'll protect the fish with ice. And you're like, ha ha, nope. And you drill a hole and you catch it anyway. So I thought that was funny. But I, it got me thinking about the stupidest ways to catch fish. And again, these are all illegal. So don't try any of these. <laughs> illegal in Ontario. So the first one, it's probably one that you've heard of before. And I'm going to ask you, Andrew, if you heard of any of these as we go through. And I know you have. So we've okay. kind of talked about these over the years. Uh, so the first one is noodling. Now, noodling is not illegal, but it is Ill illegal in Ontario. So don't try this. But what is noodling, Andrew? Noodling is, so you, it's kind of like when you're slurping off that bowl of ramen and you got that last noodle and you're like, <sighs> that's what you're doing, but to catfish and your arm is the noodle. <laughs> <laughs> that's a you're, good, you're <laughs> shoving it into their face and trying to pull them out by hand. So I thought it was funny. It said noodling involves deliberately getting eaten by a fish, <laughs> not your whole body, but generally your your hand or maybe your arm. So basically what noodling is, is you stick your arm down a catfish's mouth and then you drag it out of the water. Now, that may sound either terrifying or easy. And I'll tell you, it's one of those things. That's for sure. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so what they do is you would put your hand down along the bank and there'd be like these undercut banks where these big catfish would be sitting during the day. Uh, a lot of these catfish are nocturnal, so they're mostly active at night. And during the day, they kind of hole up in these, these holes or underneath logs or under, you know, some kind of cover. So you'd feel around with your hand till you feel its mouth. And then you jam your hand down its mouth and grab on and pull the fish up. Now, that may sound not too bad, but when you Think about the fact that some of these catfish can weigh upwards of 75 pounds. Have you ever tried fighting a, like a decent sized catfish? Like even a 10 pound channel catfish fights like heck. Oh, absolutely. They, like, they have good pull and they're strong. Catfish are one of the strongest swimming fish I, like, I think you could encounter in freshwater pretty much. Yeah. So imagine doing that, but grabbing a 75 pound catfish and trying to literally pull it up out of the water. <laughs> and it's what, what, just grabbing your arm and trying to swim the opposite direction. What terrifies me about that is, like, you remember River Monsters? Like, I love that show, first of all. Yeah. Like, I'm Jeremy Wade, extreme biologist, and, or extreme angler and biologist. <laughs> but he, he was talking about, like, the whales catfish, which are even bigger. But he was saying that a, a catfish or a fish, just one third of your body weight will overpower you in the water. Yeah. So I'm thinking, like, if you weigh, uh, let's say, 150 pounds, and you go and try and noodle a 70-pound catfish, that's more than a third of your body weight, and he can easily drag you down and overpower you in the water. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. noodling so, large catfish is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank goodness it's illegal. Now, we don't have catfish <laughs> that big in Ontario, but there are some sizable size channel catfishes. Now, you may think, how did this start? Why did people start doing this? Was it just something dumb? Well, actually, the, the Native Americans were noodling catfish long before people that you see on TikTok started doing it just for, for likes and views. But it was actually picked up by the settlers and became folk tradition throughout the South, all along the Mississippi River. And it's still incredibly popular in some places. 
But as a disclaimer, it is illegal in many states and it is illegal in Ontario. So don't try that. So the next one is called trout tickling. Now, Andrew actually mentioned this a few podcasts ago. Now, this is actually interesting because I was having a conversation with an older man that uh, grew up in Germany um, that I know. He's probably 85 years old, and he was telling me all about trout tickling because back in the day, it was completely legal to do. Uh, and I explained to him after he told me what it was that, you know, it was illegal to do now in Ontario, especially. And he was shocked, but, <laughs> you know, old timers. But anyway, so trout tickling is it sounds super easy, but it's super difficult. There's lots of stealth involved. So you basically have to almost like a ninja stalk up to this trout. And we know trout in shallow water, they, they, can, they can see pretty good above the water still at certain angles. They can feel vibration. They can see movement. So you basically have to crawl up to this thing, super stealth, supernatural, and you stick your hand in the water super slowly. It's not like where you just shove your hand down and start tickling. You're like, Hoo -hoo -hoo -hoo. no, nothing like that. You've got to slowly get your hand underneath this trout on the belly. Now, what happens is you actually slowly put your hand up on its belly and you start tickling it sort of like you start you know, rubbing your fingers across uh, the belly of the trout. Now, if you do this correctly, it sounds like, oh, that, that would be pretty easy. It's not. Not that I've tried it, but I hear it's pretty difficult. But if you do this correctly and with enough stealth and finesse, the fish actually just, for some reason, it just gets like, uh, how do they say it? It goes into a trance almost. It's almost like when you shine a light into a frog's eyes when you catch it and it just kind of, you know, sits there and does nothing. So when you tickle the belly of a trout, it actually, for some reason, just becomes just still. And then that gives you the ability just to grab it. And what they usually do is they don't grab it, but they'll actually put their hand under it and just throw it up onto the bank. And then they can pounce on it after before it flops back in the water. Now, is this something you think you could do, Andrew? I, I think if it came down to it, I could do it. I, I think so, too. There have been times I've, you know, gotten very, especially with salmon in the creek. I mean, how many times have we got our ankles bashed by a Chinook? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I was talking to my... Uh, an older gentleman I work with, uh, he's from England, and he was saying, he's just telling a story about how I used to do trout tickling, and I was like, what is that? Because I didn't know. Yeah. And so, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, you just, you go up, and just like he said, tickle them underneath, and then as soon as they'd, they'd calm down, you just, like, throw them onto the bank, and it's like, what did you do with all these trout? He's like, yeah, we just threw them at each other. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> like, why it's illegal. <laughs> being schoolboys back in ye old England. <laughs> Actually, funny enough, it says uh, in this article, the unusual technique used to be especially popular in Britain. So in Europe and, and in Britain in that area. Uh, and in fact, even Shakespeare mentioned it back in the day. So it's something that That's funny. was very popular back in the day. And, and I think that the reason why it was as well as noodling is you don't need any equipment. You know, say you're hungry, like us catch fish for dinner. Don't have a rod and a reel. Don't have any lures, nothing like that. No bait. All you need is your hand. <laughs> you can go down and either jam it down a fish's mouth, throw it up on the bank, wrestle it through the water, or you can tickle it. Or like, <laughs> so all the pictures like Macbeth be like, to tickle or not to tickle? <laughs> that is the question. And then a <laughs> conservation officer walks up. He's like, don't do that. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's two of them. Now, this this third one is very niche because it's about it's how it's only done in a certain, certain area. area. So it's actually called flounder trampling. <laughs> yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. So trampling a flounder is another weird technique from, uh, from Europe as well. And it was most popular in Scotland, which actually has a flounder trampling competition, or at least it did back in the day. It had the World Flounder Trampling Championships. So this is something that actually happens. Now, what happens to do this properly, I guess, is you wade through the shallow, muddy water until you see a flounder. Now, if you know anything about flounder, describe a flounder, Andrew, for us. Flat, both eyes on top of its head. And uh, you, ever, you ever seen SpongeBob where it has that flounder? What's his name? Something flounder? <laughs> and Mrs. Bust Boarding School just turns sideways and disappears. Flats. <laughs> yeah, flats. Yeah, so there's a, yeah, they're just like a halibut, but small. Yeah, so when you see them on the bottom, they're just flat on the bottom, two eyes facing up, and they just sit on the bottom. Oftentimes, they get covered in some sand and stuff to try to camouflage themselves. And they're like themselves. brown or olive green a lot of the time, so they blend in really well with, with the bottom. Yeah, so when you see these, you're wading through shallow water until you see a flander. 
and then you stand on it. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Hey, you, st- Tony. <laughs> you stand right on the flounder. And I guess it says trampling. You're not like really stomping on it because you have to have some stealth. I guess you just slowly put your foot on and step on it. Now, is this easy? It sounds pretty easy. But the main reason that it generally isn't done anymore is because it's pretty cruel to fish. <laughs> so obviously, like if you're going to keep a fish to eat or if you have a sport with fish, you know, you do your best to treat the animal with respect, obviously, even if you're killing it, kill it respectfully. But trampling on a flounder, pretty cruel just to step on it and then maybe you don't step on it to kill it and it gets injured and it's just it's it's not a good look for whoever is trampling flounder so it's basically illegal in most places so don't try this either not that we have flounder but don't try to do like salmon trampling that's bad don't do that okay another cool one well it's not even cool this is actually super cheating this is like cheating times 10 so one way that some people catch fish is by using animals I'm sure you've heard of this, but humans aren't naturally good at catching fish. Like we figured out ways to do it, obviously. Like we have rods and reels and a million different lures and sharp hooks and everything, visible line. But what creatures are the best at catching fish, Andrew, would you say? I'd say birds or bears. Birds. Birds, 100%. Like it's like some birds were specifically designed to be the best predator for, for fish. And they're just so good at doing it. So what happens is, and this oftentimes happens in uh, in Asian countries, is they'll actually basically tie up a cormorant, and they tie one of the. You've seen these cormorant, these birds that can literally swallow like a three pound bass whole, right? We've had like an uh, an invasive amount of them come into Ontario. If you've ever been around any of the lakes near, in southern Ontario, they're full of them. These fish can, or these birds can actually swallow like a huge fish, and they eat tons of fish every day. And they're really good at catching fish. So what these people in Asia figured out is they'll tie a rope around this bird's neck, a really long rope, and they'll let the bird dive into the water and catch a fish. Now, this rope is just tight enough around its throat that the fish cannot go down the throat. So as, as the bird's trying to swallow a fish, it gets stuck in the throat. It can't swallow it. So they have the, the, you know, the rope pretty tight. So what happens is then they pull the rope in and they grab the fish out of the cormorant's mouth pull it out, chuck it in their boat, they keep the fish, they throw the cormorant back in the water, and it catches another fish. And I've actually seen pictures where they have not just one, but they'll have multiple cormorants all working, just literally catching all the fish in the area. So that obviously is illegal in so many ways. So don't try that. Although that would be a very effective way to catch fish uh, in, I guess, like the zombie apocalypse, if that ever happens. But I wouldn't do that. (laughs) So anyway... I thought that was pretty funny because I did see some posts on uh, on YouTube or something where they showed these people doing that. And I was like, that's ridiculous. But I mean, wow. it's smart, but pretty sketchy. Now, this this one, I'm pretty sure that you haven't heard, Andrew. I'm pretty sure none of our listeners have heard of this because when I saw this, I was like, that's crazy. I, I, I wouldn't even think that anyone <laughs> would use this animal to help me catch fish. So it's by using a horse. Now, what they call it is horseback... <laughs> horseback trolling so basically imagine uh the ocean when it's low tide okay there's there's not a lot of water you have all these like big pools full of fish that get trapped in there so what they do is they'll have two horses and a huge net between them and two people will ride the horses slowly through these pools just collecting all the fish with their nets and they can actually cover like large amounts of area uh as opposed to going in there with nets or or throwing in nets so they use horses to do it. And the horses, um, they basically, they love it because they're just running through water anyway. So it's like win-win. You catch fish and the horses have fun too. So <laughs> so it's still done. And they actually use it too to catch shrimp, which aren't fish, but similar. So it's actually a tradition in many places. But again, in Ontario, don't get on a horse with your buddy and drag nets around the mouth of the river mouth to catch salmon or steelhead or anything like that. Because again, That is illegal. But I would love to see the ticket. I'd love to see what the conservation officer writes on the ticket. (laughs) What's the what's the charge? Well, it's called um, horseback trolling. (laughs) It's a new one. It is bad. (laughs) Conservation officers can uh, legally like uh, like remove uh, what's it? Impound your vehicle. 
right? Your your boat, your vessel, even your car. Yeah. And so imagine them just like impounding the horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is technically my vehicle. <laughs> Although it would be a great chase though, because imagine you saw someone come to arrest you and you just like drop the net, just was like, go, go bullseye, go. And he <laughs> just out disappear. Main tracker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm screwed. <laughs> so I got one more, and this one's actually pretty interesting because I'm sure some of us have seen something like this. Now, this is this is not a way of catching fish, but this is also something that I'm pretty sure is illegal in Ontario, so don't try this. This is called scarping. Any ideas? No? Okay. I, I didn't have either. So have you ever seen um, in the areas that are infested with Asian carp, have you ever seen those people on water skis with swords? And and as they're getting pulled behind the boat, the carp spook and they jump out of the water, right? It happens I've so much. I've seen them with that... crossbows and I've seen them with nets, but I've never seen yep. them with swords on yep. water skis. So it's gotten to such, there's so many of these, these carp, these invasive carp that basically they even cause people injuries. They're driving down the lake really fast. All these carp will just spook and jump straight out of the water. They can jump, you know, 10 feet out of the water almost. And then they get, boom, they smack you in the head or they smack your boat. They break your windshield like they're big fish, right? Mm -hmm. So what these people decided to do <laughs> is they got a sword and water skis. And basically, they basically chop these fish in half or they try to. <laughs> so they call themselves eco warriors because they're basically doing that now unfortunately this is illegal it says hey does this sound like something fun you'd like to try as well they're wearing like football helmets just in case a car hits them in the head like safety is involved i was gonna say like do they except have for any the padding on <laughs> it's so like the water skis you're you're like especially water skis your legs are not together i yeah. hope they're wearing protective equipment <laughs> <laughs> they are so it says is this something that you'd like to try unfortunately you can't <laughs> The group can't get insurance to run <laughs> scarping trips. Imagine your insurance company. You're like, what are, you, what are you looking to do fishing? You're like, it involves swords and water skis. And they're like, no, get out of here. <laughs> well, I guess, would it be considered safer than spelunking, though? Like cave diving? Because that might be a way to, you know, like, what are you doing? What is safer than cave diving? <laughs> <laughs> So it says that it, it could pers it could be instead of a, a going out with a group with a business, it says it's strictly a personal hobby. So I don't know if that means that it's actually not illegal to do. Definitely in Ontario, I could see that being illegal. But they actually do charter trips, this company that does it, but they have to stick to normal equipment like bow and arrows and tridents, which, uh, you know, the normal equipment. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was interesting because of all those things that I mentioned, I almost guarantee that there has been way crazier ways in our local area that people have tried to catch fish, but all those are illegal. So don't try them. I just thought they were funny. But anyway, that's my interesting fishing fact. <laughs> also, if you've done any of those, send me a message and I guarantee I won't turn you into the conservation officers. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> just kidding. Don't send that. All right. Well, that is that. I got to give you an A, an A plus. That's a hundred percent. That was a very good, very good grade on that. Interesting fishing fact. Sweet. I definitely learned some new things that I definitely won't do, but definitely want to try. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're gonna launch, launch right in. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we're gonna launch right into, and uh, you know, no pun intended, like a boat launch, into our boat prep topic. Ah. Now, if you were thinking, oh, like, well, I don't have a boat then don't worry. We have some stuff for you, too. Our, our boat topic, we're not going to be talking about these guys with their big bass boats. I might retry that sentence. Talk about these guys with their big bass boats. And, uh, you know, where they maybe have a marina, marina look after them, or even if they do it themselves, there's a lot that can go into looking after those boats and those motors and whatnot. We're going to be talking about the average Ontario angler's vessel. So that's going to be stuff like uh, aluminum boats, small tenors, canoes, kayaks, uh, you know, even not they're going to talk about it, but if you fish off a paddleboard, that's also a vessel. So there's some things that you'll even be able to take away from this as well. We're also going to be talking about a bit of prep and preparation for your gear, like your tackle and your rods and reels. So even if you are a shore angler, there's a bit of this, a bit of information in this episode about some things that are good to think about when approaching this open water season. Uh, perhaps getting ready for your first trip out there. So first of all, 
why is preparation a good idea? I would say it's because you don't want issues when you're fishing. <laughs> it's true. Like how many times did we, we always made fun of my brother uh, when he, you know, first trip of the uh, fishing trip in the, at the cottage and it would take him, you know, four or five tries before he actually got that motor running of him trying to start it and realizing, oh, I don't have this with me or uh, the spark plugs aren't screwed in. So he has to paddle back up river. How many times did that happen, Jesse? So many. Also a few times when we <laughs> ran out of gas too. So <laughs> good times. So preparation, it can, can make or break your, especially your first outing. Uh, another thing is, especially if you have an issue with uh, that an unknown issue, let's say you had a bunch of water that got trapped inside your, your kayak and it was left over winter and it froze and now you have giant cracks. Uh, trust me, the water out there right now is very cold. Just now there recently and it was only in the high 30s. So it's, and 30s is in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. <laughs> yeah. So... So the the water temps right now, worst case, you know, if you have a, a an issue with your hull or something like that in your boat, you do not want to be finding that out when you're already paddled an hour away from your boat launch. But one of the easiest things to do or, or the best things to start off with is making a checklist. So I'm going to kind of go over for mine. I have, again, my aluminum boat is a 14 foot aluminum. I've got a, a, you know, gas motor, a two stroke on the back. I also have an electric motor and I have some electrical wiring that have ran through it. So that's going to, we're going to cover essentially what I'm going to be doing this, this spring and then anything that may apply to you or your canoes. I know Jesse has one. We're going to talk about that as well, or even the kayaks. Take a look at, uh, make your own checklist for your own purposes, what you need to do to make sure that you will be all prepped to be out there safe and hooked into those big ones. So first of all, I know for me, I need to check my hull. <laughs> because uh, I, I got why. a couple cracks. <laughs> I got a couple cracks. It's an old boat. This thing is what, 40, 50 years old? At it's got to be minimum 40, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the aluminum, it's getting old. It's getting brittle. It had giant gashes in it when I got it that I repaired. So every spring, I like to do a full inspection. Now, I, I know I've got about a four-inch crack that's on there that I need to get repaired. So that I already know I'm going to look at that, but I'm also going to be looking for any other small cracks that might be coming up or loose rivets, anything like that. Uh, you can also do a water test. So if you are concerned about anything on your, on your boat or canoe or kayak, you get it set up in your driveway, you run a hose over to it and you fill it up on the inside with water and you just wait and see if you see any water coming out. It's a great way to test if your boat has leaks, if it comes out of it, then you know that water's going to come into it at some point. But that's that's kind of the first one that I'd I'd look at. Uh, if you do have an engine, I, I got to tell a story. So speaking of my brother again, this was the first trip out with his motor. It was you know midsummer still. We were at the cottage, and he pushes off the dock. It's like all ready to go, and he's pulling on his motor, and it's not starting. Then he looks like oh the gas can. It's sitting on the dock. <laughs> so he paddles back up, grabs the gas can, pushes himself back off the dock. And he's yanking on this motor. It's it's not. He's like, oh, I didn't prime the gas. So he's got priming the gas gas tank by hand now. Paddles back up. Because again, this is on a river. So every time he pushes off and is pulling this thing for like 10 minutes, he just drifts 200 yards downstream. <laughs> so then he comes back, back up to the dock. And he's like, oh, I, I forgot to, uh, what did he forget then? There's like four times he pushed off. He forgot something else. Uh, and then the fourth time he goes, he's like, it's still not starting. And he, he realizes he didn't screw in the spark plugs <laughs> or he, he detached the coils or something from when he had serviced it. So then he's got to screw in the part, spark plugs. And eventually, yes, we did get it started and we had a great fishing trip again, but with a bit of preparation, he would have saved himself about half an hour and so, you know, saved himself those sore shoulders from paddling an aluminum boat back up, up river <laughs> multiple times. He, so he check listens to every episode. He's just going to be like right now, like so mad. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's good. It's like you could have tied the, the boat to the dock, man. You could have yeah. done it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go over a couple, couple tips for, for that stuff in a, in a bit too. But if you do have an engine, uh, check your spark plugs to make sure that they're, they're still sparking. Uh, check the oil. I know even Jesse, you have your four stroke, your two and a half horse. Uh, checking the gear lube. We usually do that in the fall. But it's a good idea if you haven't done so, definitely check before you take it out again this spring. Make sure your gear lube is, is all good. If you have a four-stroke, check your oil in it. 
And I know for both of us, Jesse, uh, me, myself, myself especially, I need to get a backup pull cord because I yes. do not want to be one of those guys who are just trying to hand start their motor <laughs> <laughs> two hours from the boat launch. It happened. So I have a story about that. One of one of my old fishing buddies who moved away, he bought this old, I don't even know how old it was. It was a 1970s Johnson Seahorse. It was old, maybe 60s even. And he had that on a little 10, 12 foot boat. And we were out there and he's pulling the, the motor to start it. And we're far away from the boat launch and it, the cord snapped. The cord literally snapped. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, we're doomed now. <laughs> and he had a bunch of tools, thank goodness. And he took the whole thing apart and he like, it, it always comes with a bit of extra rope in there and he pulled it out, attached the handle back to it and got it in. But it was a big ordeal that took like 45 minutes. So yeah, <laughs> if if you have an older boat, it definitely would be a wise thing to have a bunch of tools and some spare parts that you might need. Like on my boat, for instance, I don't know if you're going to get into this, but I have a two and a half horsepower Suzuki on my canoe, on my flatback canoe. I have extra parts and tools that I bring in my boat safety kit. I have a pair of pliers. I have a screwdriver. I have uh, whatever tools I need to do basic jobs. I also carry a spare prop, which is actually mounted inside of my canoe under one of the seats. It's screwed in there. I bolt it on. So it's always there if I need it. If I chip, you know, the prop on a rock or something. So always have the tools you need to do minor repairs just to get you back to the launch. Or if you're camping or something. You don't want to be like four or 10 kilometers away from the launch and like your prop breaks. So you don't have a spare prop. Like that is a disaster. That's how you turn a crappy fishing trip into an absolutely terrible, terrible fishing trip. That's the so kind of trip that makes you want to sell all your gear when you get back home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even for myself, when, I, uh, when I'm working on or when I'm going fishing, even on day trips, whenever I take my boat out, especially if I'm going on a, a trip, like a week-long trip if I'm interior camping. I always make sure, because I have an aluminum boat, it's pretty easy, but any it'll work on any boat. Is I keep a couple, uh, a tube of JB Weld. Marine. Marine Weld. And that stuff is like rock solid. It works really, really well. And it sets up in about four hours. You can, I think it's four, I think four, four or six hours. So even last year at the cottage, I had that big crack and I was getting a lot of water coming in. And so what I had to do was I got the uh, the JB weld and I dragged my, my boat up on shore, lifted up, propped it up a bit, and was able to get some of that epoxy on the inside and outside of that crack. And that lasted me for the next, well, that was uh, midsummer when that happened. And that lasted me without leaks all, all year into musky season. Now, yep. that's the thing that I'm going to be properly repairing now. I'm going to be riveting a new piece of aluminum to it and some epoxy and getting that all fixed up but the uh the other thing i wanted to mention is with electronics so check your battery make sure you're, you're if you're using a trolling motor let's say you don't have a gas motor but use a trolling motor make sure your battery is holding its charge well it's charging up fully still uh, double check the electronic wiring that's going through your boat because depending on i know last year jesse and i we were fishing and it kept tripping the breaker we we're wondering why yeah, and it's because he had these extensions on his uh, trolling motor, on the cords, and moisture had gotten inside that it connected midway, and it was starting to short out. So yeah. that took us a little while to figure out. <laughs> you know, yeah, back on the boat, but you know, so it might be a good idea to to double check that uh, in advance. Uh, even rodents and stuff like that. And my boat gets stored outside, so I got to make sure that you know mice, rats haven't gone in. And, chewed my wiring to bits where it's going to short out or cause any damage to you know any of my uh, like my fish finder or to my trolling motor i don't want anything to be damaging my investment yeah and for anyone who has a slightly larger boat where you're using on a trailer so even some kayak guys use that just again make sure your trailer is all good uh you know your straps you're tying it down they aren't frayed they aren't getting damaged and even but again, your your bearings and whatnot are all good for towing whatever you have to to get to your lake. So that kind of covers a good checklist of things to check on on your vessel every time. Or well, every time is not a bad idea, but definitely every year before you get going, make sure all that's in good repair. Now, one thing that we always mention, Jesse, when we are in 
in a canoe or in the boat? What is something we always have on? A good attitude and a life jacket. <laughs> At least the life jacket. Yes. Yes, you need it. And I know we went, I know a lot of people don't wear them. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are like, you know what? I don't need it. I can swim. People drown every year. Just wear it. Yeah. And, you know, it's not legally required as long as you have it in your vessel. That is abiding by the law. But safety wise, especially, you know, in colder water temperatures, but all year round, the, the odds of, of you getting injured or something like that or becoming incapacitated in some way, maybe you get, you know, hit by another boat and you get knocked over that way. You've seen videos, I'm sure, online of, you know, guys not paying attention and they're driving this, you know, 24 foot boat right into another one. Like, that's something where I would want to make sure I have a flotation device because if I've got two broken arms, I can't swim very well. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll I would cast a bit. I would cast my musky lure at you, snag you, and then reel you in. No just, problem. just, just throw all your top waters at me. I'll hook them onto my shirt so I just start floating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but one thing to keep in mind is, uh, your life jacket can actually expire. Well, I should say, I should clarify this: the inflating ones can expire or parts of it. So you have to make sure that your cartridge and stuff is good. It's up to date. That your trigger is in, is still in good condition. It's not getting damaged or whatnot. Make sure that it's not you know covered in mold or or that the the liner's been torn or it's been sitting in the sun for you know two years in the deck of a boat or in a window, and now that whole liner is, is gonna as soon as it tries to inflate is gonna leak. So make sure that your life jacket is in good repair. And Something just to add, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say, a lot of people don't like wearing a life jacket. I'm totally with you. I understand. And if we're in a stable boat and we're fishing in shallow water, generally we're not going to wear our life jackets like our big foam ones back in the day. We're only going to wear them as we're driving. I can see that. That's, that's fairly safe. But in a small craft, I like to wear one all the time, especially if I'm fishing by myself. And one thing that we both did, I did it first and Andrew eventually got one as well, is we got inflatable life jackets. Now, they're not the best for every situation, but they're so small and thin. I know they're expensive. That's why we didn't have one for years. I've only had mine for about two years now, but I, I would never go back. And again, mm -hmm. I still have my foam one for other circumstances, but you can wear them all day, even when we're fishing. Like normally we'd wear our foam ones and get to the spot, you know, the boat slows down, stops, take off your life jacket and start fishing. Now we just have our inflatables on. They're so comfortable. They're lightweight. You forget you're wearing it. You literally forget you're wearing it half the time and you don't have to worry about taking it on, taking it off. And Heaven forbid, you know, a boat hits you or you fall in the water, that thing's going to inflate. You're fine. They have the automatic mm -hmm. ones. They also have the manual ones. But I feel like if you're a serious angler and you have a little bit of a budget to buy an inflatable, do it. And they go on sale all the time. I pick them up. You can buy, you know, Andrew, how much did yours cost? 150 well, bucks? Mine cost 100 bucks. I 100 got it bucks. at Costco. Yeah. Yeah. And I bought the Mustang one, which is a little more pricey. I think I paid... 200 bucks for it or 169 dollars for it on sale at a, like at a sale at like a local uh, fishing store so keep your eyes out the inflatable ones are amazing again they're not the best for every situation we'll get into that in another podcast because that's a huge topic but that's an investment in your life and you can wear it the whole time it's great mm -hmm. and the one thing i wanted to mention that a very good point is uh with the inflatable life jackets they do not count as a personal flotation device unless you are wearing it so if you have that in the boat, but it's not on you, you are not abiding by the like That is illegal at that point. You need to have, if you're not going to wear it, which again, not recommended, but let's say you're in a larger boat or something like that, and uh, you need to have those foam life jackets. If you're not going to be wearing them all the time, it has to be those foam ones to have in the boat. But that's why we like those inflatable ones, because like Jesse says, we forget it's on. I can't tell you how many times, well, it's every time I go to back down the the trailer back to the boat launch and i sit down and i realize i'm still wearing my life jacket in the car <laughs> we're an hour home we're an hour drive home and he's still wearing it he's like eh. <laughs> in yeah. case i spill my coffee i can be safe plus if you wear it topless and you're just wearing if you're a guy anyway and you're wearing it topless and you're just wearing the life jacket it gives you the coolest tan lines ever <laughs> just like two big vertical bars down your chest <laughs> it's terrible so another another safety thing that I would recommend looking at 
periodically throughout the year is a good idea, but especially beginning of your season, is the orange bucket. Yeah. So that everyone knows what the orange bucket is. It's there's a couple of different brands that make them. You can usually pick them up for fifteen to twenty bucks or something like that. And it's got your floating floating rope. It's got a whistle. It's got uh, a waterproof flashlight, and it has the bailing bucket, which is what holds everything. Now, if I had to ask you, Jesse, what is the one thing that I can promise about 50% of our listeners out there, if they went and inspected your bucket, what needs replacing right now? The flashlight batteries. 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. Or, or the flashlight in general. And I tell you, the one thing that is a tip from working at the fishing store, most people assume that that flashlight comes with batteries when you buy it. So they'll buy the orange bucket, throw it in their boat. Oftentimes they don't come with batteries. So you need mm-hmm. to buy batteries, put them in. And while you're at it, buy an extra set and keep them inside of your, your bucket as well. Because A, batteries don't last forever. And two, definitely check them because they can corrode in your flashlight and destroy it. So you got to yep. check it multiple times so, a year. So if you were a smart cookie, what you've done is when you put your boat away for the fall, you took the batteries out of that flashlight. If you are like me and you forgot to do so, you have an acid-filled flashlight right now <laughs> it is it is less than safe now <laughs> yeah and if you have really bad fortune then that acid has now leaked over into that rope it's compromised the rope it makes that whistle taste really bad when you try and blow on it it's not not a good day thankfully those buckets don't cost a lot so if you are concerned about anything in there you can always just buy another one uh, or you can also buy just those waterproof flashlights to make sure that that is up to date if yours has corroded is not working Make sure that the batteries are good for the cost of, you know, the $3 to go put some dollar store batteries in there every single year. Take it out at the end. You know you're going to be be safe. And if you do have a conservation officer come and check, they will check that to make sure you have everything you need in that bucket. That's one of the things. They look at life jackets and they look at that pail. Yeah. So if you weren't prepared, be prepared for a ticket. And one thing that I've done, and I know this is a little bit more of a pricey thing. But again, this bucket is very important. We always think, oh, it's important to have in case someone stops me. (laughs) But it's also important because it has life-saving things in it. So like you need the rope, you need the whistle, you need the bailing bucket, you need all those things. But what I've done is the crappy flashlight that comes with the bailing bucket, it's terrible. It's like Dollarama quality. It's terrible. So what I I did is I actually bought a really nice rechargeable uh, flashlight. It's waterproof, which the ones they come with say they're waterproof. They're not. They're trash. So I have a really nice, um, like a tool grade, like Milwaukee rechargeable flashlight. And it's something that is super bright, way, way brighter than the one it comes with. It can recharge via USB. So if I'm in the boat, I have my power box, I can charge it up in the boat, check it and be like, oh, it's, it's low on power. Although it holds the charge really good. I can charge it up. I can use it throughout the day and put it back in the bucket. So it's multi-use too. So. If you have a bit of money and you like, I know flashlights are something cool. I always, we have a bunch of, like me and Andrew both have a bunch of flashlights. Like whenever we go camping, it's not like one. We have multiple flashlights because they come in handy. So if you like flashlights, buy a decent one, stick it in your bucket and use it for other things too. That's And if you don't want, if you, if you are concerned because you're going to be tossed around in the boat, you can pick up a decent waterproof flashlight, probably better than you can get at the store. Those little, you know, those little ones that come in the buckets, you can pick one up for 30 bucks and it's rechargeable. You can get that on Amazon and it's going to have better waterproofing, yeah. hold a better charge and be way brighter. And that's yeah. important too, because if you're at night, you're trying to use that little, you know, incandescent bulb waterproof one that's 40 years old. Uh, you know, that's not going to do you very good. And you're trying to find your way and it's, you know, rainy and dark and you had a yeah. terrible day. <laughs> Those are like four emergency only flashlights. But if you yeah. put a decent one in the box, even if it's a 10 or $20 one, it's way better than the one. And it's actually a practical flashlight at that yeah. point. You can use it for navigation, not just for, you know, oh, here's a light. So I have a light in my vessel. You just have to remember to put it back in the bucket when you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, one last thing to talk about the kind of the, the boat stuff is paddles. Ooh. Uh, take a look at, at your paddles. It is required you have one on each of your vessels. So as if people have more than one vessel, but uh, each vessel needs one paddle minimum. So check to see if that old wooden one, if it's in there forever and it's starting to split and you've got giant cracks running up the blade of that paddle, it's not going to do much good when you go and you're trying to 
you know, paddle with a broomstick now. <laughs> and, uh, or if you even have plastic ones, make sure the plastic, again, isn't, you know, or the aluminum ones, make sure it's all in working order, if, it, if it's collapsible or whatnot. Just make sure that it is going to be working for you in case of an emergency. And also, the chance of using it, I hope you don't have to, but I'd rather you had a working one with you. <laughs> I was going to say, and also, it's always great to have a paddle on you because in the odd chance that the zombie snapping turtle people come to life and start attacking humans in the water, at least you have a paddle to bash them back. Get back, get back. You wouldn't want to be that guy with a broken paddle like a fool, not being able to defend yourself. <laughs> it, <laughs> those days will come. For, <laughs> it's also handy for whacking your jerk bait when it's snagged on a uh, some a tree underwater or something it's true it's true <laughs> actually you know what i was thinking that most of the time for that <laughs> you know what i was thinking though what would be smart on your paddle i just thought of this the other day because i'm actually making a little pigtail wire lure retriever to go on a paint pool or something but on your paddle you know you're always trying to like get it down the line it slides off if you cut mm -hmm. a little slit just like a little v into the end of your paddle as long as it wasn't a nice paddle that way you could just go down your line you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right to your lure and just pop the lure out. I'm going to try that on your paddle, Andrew. I'm just going to cut a big hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> try this on your friend's paddle, not your own. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to have Wait. a little respite from our... Exactly, Jesse. I have it written down right here in my notes. Sure. <laughs> I can show you. See? <laughs> so right after personal flotation devices, I have giveaway for this episode. Ooh. Now we have an awesome giveaway. Jesse, tell us about what we're going to be, or not what we, what our awesome uh, sponsor this for this episode has done. So I would just like to pat ourselves on the back because March has been the month of giveaways for our Patreon members. So if you would like to enter automatically into all of these giveaways every single month, and this month it was four, one every weekend, uh, you have to be a Patreon member and you can sign up for our Patreon in the link below as little as two bucks a month. It helps support our show costs, but you also get automatically entered into every giveaway. And this giveaway is sponsored by, who is it, Andrew? Choppy Water Baits. Yeah, Choppy Water Baits. Now, we love supporting local tackle shops and local bait makers, and we're always happy when one reaches out to us. So Scott actually reached out to us a few months ago. And he's like, yeah, do you have any openings? I was like, absolutely, because his stuff is awesome. Now, if his stuff was sketchy, I would have been like, oh, yeah, we're pretty full till like October. But <laughs> I got him in March because, dude, this is legit stuff. So I'm just going to show you some lures quick that Choppy Water Bait Company makes. Why don't you show me some of your favorite ones, Andrew? All right, so first of all, uh, a bladed jig. His are, are really nice. He's got some amazing skirt patterns his patterns so, are good yeah very good so this is like a nice fire tiger bladed jig uh again it's, it's got uh the hooks i would say his, his, his hooks, hooks and jigs, jigs or bladed jigs or whatever all the hooks on his jigs are top notch and what's cool about them is a lot of the time on bladed jigs or or flipping jigs or whatnot the hook is is like a quite a thick gauge and not that i'm going to say they're light hooks because they aren't at all but they're much thinner than than or they are thinner than normal and even the stuff like this on his uh like this is one of his flipper swim jigs that's very crackly but that's that's asmr for those fishing people so this one here this is uh the baby bass color which looks awesome but again it's an extra wide gap hook nice and thin not crazy crazy thick this the uh the weed guard on it is just the right softness or, yeah. or stiffness I agree. But you could fish this on like a medium heavy spinning rod. Yep. And you could. you could you could sink the hook in with that. And I find that was something for a long time before I was fishing bait casters. I didn't fish a lot of jigs or when I did, I didn't have much success with them. And I think that was why I just could not set the hook strong enough to power these big hooks. You know, same thing fishing frogs. I couldn't effectively fish a frog. But these are a great option for that. But they're also thick enough. I'm not concerned about that bending out on a bass either. No. Yeah, but that's even his jigs. Like this one here is like wire tied. Some of them are like premium, like wire tied. This is not coming off. These things look legit. Look at this swim jig here. So this one here is is like perch color. Mm -hmm. This is a swim jig. Now that as a tackle junkie, I'm going to tell you things I noticed about this this uh, bait right off the bat. Number one, like Andrew said, his patterns are legit. Mm -hmm. they, they're really nice skirts. 
again, some of them are wire tied, some of them are bands. I'm not sure exactly what he offers and what, so you're gonna have to talk to him if you're gonna order stuff. But one thing I noticed is, like Andrew said, super sharp hooks. I really like the head design. The paint jobs are actually top notch. Yeah. Like he's yeah. got like sparkles and really realistic eyes and just multiple different colors on the head. It's not just one color. It looks super realistic. The weed guard, like Andrew said, nice and soft, but not too soft. We mentioned that a few podcasts ago. You don't want it for a swim jig. You don't want it to be super stiff, but you don't want it to be so soft that you're snagging stuff. Mm -hmm. But he also, on this one, he actually color matched the weed guard. So it's not a black weed guard. It's like a green pumpkin head with a green pumpkin weed guard. So you're mm -hmm. you're looking at like a really impressive little little swim jig. Now, his skirts are very long, which some people like. But what I would do on this particular one is I would actually cut a bunch off the bottom and have a super nice finesse swim jig with a little paddle tail on that. That's going to kill. And like Andrew said, he has some cool patterns. This one really caught my eye. This is one of his bladed jigs. This is like a fire tiger, like yeah. fire color. That for me, I'm 100% going to use this for pike fishing this spring because that is so bright. 100%. Beautiful. Even that jig head. You, know, you look at the jig head. head. Like I have one here too. It's it's like a chartreuse, like yellow base, and he's got like the orange spray on it, the green spray on top. Like it's a multi head, multi colored jig head. Like yeah. again, he's put a lot of effort into these. And he's even got some awesome like soft plastics to pair with it. So, you know, looking at that plated jig with one of these sick like paddle tails behind it. These are the yeah, the chartreuse chartreuse and white three point eight inch swim baits. Like that's gonna pair awesomely with the chatterbait or with the, with his bladed jigs there. Yeah. And it's great when you see companies that make jigs and plastics, because a lot of them they only make plastics or they only make jigs, and you're like, Well, I wanna you know, I want to one-stop shop it, right? I want to buy some jigs and some trailers for it. And they're like, oh, I only make jigs. Or mm -hmm. oh, I only make the trailers. I don't make the, the jigs. So it's awesome that he has that uh, ability to make both of them. And again, the one thing that we'd say with some of the stuff that he, he sent to us to show off, super high quality. I think you'd agree, Andrew. Super high Absolutely. quality. The packaging is fantastic. Not that it matters for the fish, but presentation is good. And just really good colors. I know a lot of uh, bay makers you'll see and and I wouldn't even say popular ones because usually they're not as popular for this reason. It's, they make just random colors that look good, but they're not fishy colors. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, oh, yep. this bright pink or whatever color. It's like, yeah, that's cool. But that's not a combination that actually is popular for a reason, you know? But all the combinations and the colors that he's come up with, they're just legitimately good fish catchers that are going to be fantastic. So I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about Choppy Water Bait Company. Mm -hmm. So... The guy who owns it, his name is Scott, and the only reason he says that he told me that he's successful is because he has the help from his family. Aw. I wish I had a helpful family that made baits for me. <laughs> so he says that his company, Choppy Water Baits, it basically is the definition of a family-run small business. So he has a regular job, but on the weekends, him and his wife and his daughter actually help him create and make these baits which is awesome like we were at cancast last year and we we did bump into a few of the makers in the community who were there with their their families and it's so great to see they're getting their kids and their family involved in this and helping them so scott's actually um he is a long distance truck driver so you have to think he's sitting in his truck and he's probably just thinking like the guy loves fishing obviously like what would you do andrew if you had to drive a lot for work i'd be just thinking about like oh man I'm just thinking about this color jig that I want to make, you know, maybe that's what he does. He just literally just thinks about stuff for days. And then he gets home and he's like, just raring to go. Like, Oh, I thought of this super cool color. You know, you know? how like when you, when we're driving by and we pass like a pond or a lake or a river and we're like, oh, I want to fish that as, as a long haul trucker, the guy's going to be passing so much awesome water, but he can't stop because he has to get like to his destination. Like, Oh <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not joking though. This is what he, I was talking to him the other day and he said that, so he's been driving like a truck for a long time. So he, he's had access to fish, like lots of places, obviously like cool. truck drivers don't drive 24 hours a day. Like they stop, obviously he has a rod in the back of his truck. So he's had the opportunity to fish all over North America, try different colors, see what works, see what doesn't work. And obviously like, you know, when we go traveling and we try, you know, oh, there's a local tackle shop and they have their own local brands that are local to that area and he tries different stuff like we do it mm -hmm. like if i was a truck driver i'd be doing it too i'd be driving everywhere and be like hey i picked up these jigs from south carolina like they sucked i'm gonna make something better <laughs> <laughs> so he did that so basically he uh, in his message he sent to me he's like they specialize in jigs soft plastics and custom color designs so that is cool 
because oftentimes confidence is everything. And if you have a specific color that you want, or even a specific thing about a jig that you like, like I know some people are like, are those jigs wire tied? Is the skirt wire tied? It's like, well, it can be. It's custom. Yeah, no problem. I can do that for you. Some people are like, that. I don't care about that. Other people are like, I need that or else I have no confidence. So he does customized stuff, which is awesome. And basically he can also replicate bait fish designs. Isn't that pretty cool? So like, imagine like you have a certain bait fish in your lake and you're like, hey, here's a picture of this bait fish that I caught that the smallmouth are crushing. Can you make me a chatterbait that looks just like that? <laughs> he can mm -hmm. do it. And as looking at some of the stuff that he has, absolutely like fantastic like some of these patterns like i stole these so andrew couldn't get them but look at that pattern <laughs> i'll give you a few of these don't worry <laughs> absolutely fantastic so they also they got that pattern there too yeah no they all look good i'm not joking so again we're gonna link everything down below i highly recommend if you're looking to support a local tackle company that makes all their stuff handmade and it's family run definitely check out choppy water bait Co. Um, I would like, I'll just going to read this word for word because it says it perfectly. So he says, we pride ourselves on our community partnerships. For example, for the past two years, we have donated hundreds of baits to Fishing Frenzy, an organization that connects youth with mentors to educate about the sport of fishing and the importance of conservation. That's awesome. I know the guy from Fishing Frenzy, he definitely, he, he's a beast of a guy. He literally teaches kids to fish. So if you're supporting that, you're also supporting them as well. So we would like to thank Scott for Again, sending us some of these samples, which by the way, these are awesome, but some of these we're actually going to be doing a giveaway for soon. Me and Andrew are going to sacrifice some of our, our sweet moolah, but a lot of these guys, they like to send us stuff so we can show it off on the podcast. But as you can see, we have a ton of baits. We have rooms full of baits, at least I do anyway. So we will give back some of these to our Patreon members as well. But again, we're going to talk about this giveaway and what you have to do to enter a little bit after we continue on with the main topic. So. So I just next want to look up, at this jig again, man. Look at that. It's <laughs> so good looking. Yeah. Don't don't eat it, Jesse. Don't. Oh, there's hooks in that. Don't put it in your mouth. No, don't. No, you're going to hook yourself. Oh, okay. I got it out. It's good. So planning the first trip of the year is always exciting, right? Like I know yeah. we were so pumped to get out in the canoe just a couple weeks ago. Uh, I can't wait to get the boat you know, out on the water again and, and have that first rip. Like, oh, I can't wait to smell that two stroke just burning. Oh, 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 oh. I love it. Um. <laughs> yeah, it gets my motor running too. I'll tell you, one of the most satisfying things is when we take Andrew's boat out the first time of the year, he starts it and it actually starts. And we're like, okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when during that first outing, normally what I'll, what I'll do, again, I haven't had the boat for too long, but I've, you know, had two two seasons. I started it now. Yeah, uh, it'll soon be the third season. I'll be starting it again, and I always like to choose something a little bit closer to home, so I don't drive like four or five hours north and uh, hope that everything's going to work. Because I, where I rent, I don't have, I can't even store the boat where I live. So for me to be able to do all this maintenance stuff, uh, you know, everything and test the motor and stuff, especially make sure it's running, I can't always do that, you know, in my driveway. So I like to, to have a, a place, even if it's local, uh, you know, even on Lake Ontario, there's some places in the harbors you can go and you can just, uh, like Whitby Harbor is one, where you can just launch your boat and try it out. Uh, if you're going to if some of the Kawartha Lakes are closer, or even Scugog is fairly close. You know, there's, there's a lot of places that are closer to the GTA that you don't have to be driving crazy far in order to test your boat. But I would say, and I've dealt with this a couple times, I haven't done it myself, thankfully, but don't be one of those guys who keeps your boat <laughs> on the trailer and just backs it down and, and they're working on their boat on the boat on the boat ramp yep i'm there or someone else is there trying to launch a boat because they've already done that and want to get fishing so it doesn't mean that you can't do so on the lake just uh if you have a boat launch uh launch your boat keep it anchored just offshore or if there's a, a long dock there you can have your boat you know down the end of the dock pull it around to the outside of the dock so it's not in the in the launch area and do your testing there it's still tied up don't forget your boat plug. It's been all winter long. Don't forget the boat plug. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. But uh, but that's something definitely you can do that on the lake if you can't test everything at home properly, and or you don't want to damage your motor because you don't want to run it dry. Obviously, you don't. So doing so, but just make sure you are out of the way of anyone else that wants to come in to use that. Don't be one of those guys. 
Uh, there's a little bit I want to talk about, uh, which I'll pass it up to Jesse for uh, other maintenance. So for rods, reels, tackle, what is something that you like to do in the springtime to get prepped for the next fishing season? So as you can see, I have quite a bit of tackle. You can't see even on this side, I have a, like a whole shelf full of reels. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're someone like me that owns a lot of reels, oftentimes you don't have a lot of maintenance because if you only have one or two reels, generally you're going to run those two reels really hard. If you have a bunch, it's kind of spread out throughout the year. But what I like to do every year is I like to just make sure my reels are ready to go, put new line on them. So in the fall, what I do at the end of the season is I do clean them up. I'll do some general maintenance, oil them so that they're ready to go. And then come spring, I have to put new line on. I always, if it's braid, I'll make sure that I check. Oftentimes people will be like, you know, braid lasts forever. You can have the same line for 10 years. That is true. But make sure that it's not all frayed and, you know, it has, you know, abrasions on it. So you might have to cut off maybe 20 feet of it if it's still long enough. But if not, now's the time to put on your, your new monofilament or your new fluorocarbon, get everything ready to go as for the reels. And that's pretty much all I do. Like, it's not crazy. Like, rods don't really need any maintenance. What I mm -hmm. Just do a quick check of all the guides, make sure nothing's cracked. I did lose a really good fish one time because my top tip had a crack in it. and I. It just sheared my line and snapped me off right near the shore. I, I, that could have been avoided if I had seen that earlier, but I was dumb and I didn't check. So check all those little things. But one thing that I, I think you're going to get into this, but I think the biggest thing, and I always, I kind of look forward to it, but I'm also, also kind of like terrified of it is just like organizing all my tackle. Because like over the winter, oftentimes you get bored in the winter and you just like, have tackle everywhere and it's just like all over the place it's maybe from last year you just have boxes full of random stuff you know you have like a few lures left in a box and you're like i don't know what to do with this you just dump it into one other box and you have this big tangle so spring is the time that i try to organize all that but many you know fingers get pricked <laughs> it's terrible yeah the uh if, if you haven't already done so like just saying in the fall i like to do some of the organization uh, but in the spring, I'll always reorganize again. I'll look at perhaps the first few trips I have coming up. Sometimes I have a few extra tackle trays and I'll set it up for, you know, I'm going for early spring pike. I know I'm not going to be using anything fast, so I can get rid of, you know, all these other random baits I might have in my pike box. And I'm going to put in, you know, my jerk baits, my big blade chatter baits, all these like slower baits presentations. I'm not going to bring topwaters because it's super early. So if you can organize a couple trays for perhaps the first or two trips coming up, you can do that. The biggest thing I would say is, like, that I always am hard on myself on, is hooks. And I was, I, I'm hard on myself because for a long time, I wasn't. And I, yep. I, I lost a lot of good baits <laughs> because they got so rusty, I could not just, you know, breathe new life into them. The eyelets that were attached to the hooks were starting to go, and they're supposed to be stainless steel. So I don't know what what i was doing wrong but i was doing something wrong so now i always <laughs> make sure i i uh, dry out my tackle trays every time they get pulled out and used but in the spring you have some bit of time you know getting prepped again because you're not bringing out in my experience not bringing out all my baits on the first trip uh, i'm picking out a few so i'll make sure that those specifically i'll take my time make sure that i have good hooks on those that they're ready to go ready to use and uh, even if you don't have any replacement hooks at this time taking out anything that's rusty already will help prevent more rust from accumulating on either that bait or other ones nearby so just make sure that there's nothing that's rusty in your tackle box right now that's that's about it for for our, our kind of checklist of what i'd go over for getting prepped for your, your first fishing trip of the year or first boating trip whatever you're looking forward to do and whether you have a kayak a canoe a tinner or you do have a bass boat, make sure, double check, make sure you're going to be safe in the water, make sure that you're going to be able to traverse the water, <laughs> that it's actually going to run, it's not going to sink, and that you're going to be able to catch some big ones this, this spring and this summer. We do have a bit of uh, housekeeping. We're going to have Jesse talk to us about uh, some of the housekeeping stuff this week. We talk about it every single episode, but yeah, it's something that has to be done. This is the only housekeeping that I actually slightly enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, my wife's listening to this like, what? <laughs> so uh, we would like to thank everyone who uh, is listening to this episode. We really appreciate it. We're actually, we're still ranking pretty high. We're pretty happy. Like the uh, big things happening this year. We've actually 
I, a little bit of news first. I actually just got the packages in the mail today. We actually bought a drone. So I'm really excited about that. We're going to get some sick B-roll. I actually bought Andrew an action cam. So he has one in his chest. So we both have one now. So he's excited about that. We bought some new wireless mics. So whenever we go to a trade show, you probably notice if you've watched any of our social media, Instagram, mostly in YouTube, we try to do some, you know, fun interviews. Not We're not crazy. We're not going to do 50 of them, but we like to do some fun interviews. But it's also going to help us when we're actually out filming more content this year. We actually really enjoy making video content. Podcast is fun. Video content is cool too. So we're excited to use all that new uh, camera gear and stuff like that, that that we've invested into. So hopefully I don't crash it after the first day. So that'll be cool. <laughs> but we would like to thank everyone who supports this weekly podcast. There are expenses that come up every single month. We do have a lot of programs and, and services that we have to pay for to keep this running smoothly and making it sound good, as well as uh, the hours and hours it takes to edit. So we do appreciate all those Patreon members who support the show as well. Patreon members, you have a warm and fuzzy feeling, of course. We do appreciate all of you. But at the same time, you also get entered into all the giveaways. And to go into that, for Choppy Water Bait Company, all these cool baits, he actually has donated to one lucky Patreon member that we draw $100 of value. Ooh. I always tell these guys, like, yeah, 50 bucks is good. Nope, 100 bucks. This guy's serious. <laughs> So we're going to draw that within the next week of you listening to this. We do appreciate Scott doing that. That is huge. Like honestly, a hundred mm-hmm. bucks of this stuff. And I'll tell you his stuff. It's not expensive. Like the swim jigs and the, and the bladed jigs and all the plastic. They're very reasonably priced. So for a hundred bucks, oh my goodness, you get a ton of stuff. But I'm going to show you one bait. We did show you the swim jig, the bladed jig, a bunch of the other jigs. He also has football jigs, um, like these cool little... What do you call these? A split tail, like little jerk bait, uh, soft plastic mm-hmm. jerk baits. Those are going to be killer for Wally. But I'm going to show you one bait that I 100% am going to slay on this year. That's me being confident. I'm going to slay. So he makes these. The packaging is awesome. These are his 2.8 inch swim baits. They're in a nice little clamshell. These mm-hmm. clamshells help the swim bait stay completely straight. If you ever get these in a package that they're not like this, oftentimes the tail is bent. And then they're useless. So I'm really happy that he has the actual super nice packaging. But check this out. So this is his 2.7 inch swim bait. And I have that on a Great Lakes finesse. Uh, what do you call these things? The sneaky underspin. These are like one of the hottest baits right now. The sneaky underspin. Check out how sick that looks. The 2.8 inch with that little underspin. That is going to be an actual smallmouth destroyer. <laughs> And a wall, I think, too, but that is going to be something super cool. These things look like they're almost like designed to like be on each other. Super nice. So that is one thing that I'm excited to try. But again, Patreon members get entered automatically. So make sure that you check out the Patreon app or check out online every week because we do post the live draws or they're not live, but the draws every week as well. If you're not on the Patreon app and you are a Patreon member, I will actually email you. I won't just steal your stuff. I'm like, yeah, it was me that won. <laughs> Send it to the same address that you sent the other things. But anyway, so that's that's the housekeeping. We'd like to thank again everyone for listening and a huge thanks to Choppy Water Bait Co. for uh, sponsoring this episode with an awesome giveaway. And yeah, I'm just excited. It's just like, it just seems like the last few weeks, it's like springs here and it smells good. I saw like 18 robins the other day. It seems like yep. they all come in at once. Hearing and I'm birds. Like, yes. Oh. It's nice and to then, hear birds in the morning again. Yeah. And then we got out in the boat maybe two weeks ago, right? It's just like, it's so nice. And I'm, I'm really excited for everyone to actually get it on the water. But like Andrew said, there is some preparation. So this was a great episode. And I know we just kind of scratched the surface, but those are the main things you really have to, you know, you got to do at a minimum. And I'd also say, you mentioned the boat plug. Buy an extra boat plug and put it in your safety kit, in your, your orange tail, and mm-hmm. that way you'll never forget it. Yep. Unless you're dumb and you forget the orange tail, which you should never do. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, so yeah, everyone who is already a Patreon member, you are all, already entered to win that Choppy Baits giveaway. Again, $100 to the value, which is insane to get some premium premium stuff from him. Uh, but again, we have, this is our, what, third giveaway this month? Yep. And there's going to be another one coming still. So if you haven't, you know, you know started your Patreon account yet and started supporting, there's we're going to be having giveaways going forward. Going forward. <laughs> for a every long month, time. at least two every Jesse's month. got a bunch. He's working hard to get a bunch of awesome guys lined up for, for these giveaways. 
So before we finish our our podcast today, we have the one last thing, and as tradition states, Jesse has the quote of the week. The quote of the week is, when the water is choppy, make sure you have your orange pail, or else you'll be bopping. <laughs> so I can't rhyme. It was a good quote. 